So in your typical um, early onset to progression microvalve disease handled as an outpatient, you, when you see left atrial enlargement and early clinical signs, you'll add an ACE inhibitor. Enalapril, again, uh, because benazapril is eliminated by the liver and not the kidney, enalapril is both. Benazapril is liver only. You will see some clinicians prefer benazapril in their patients over enalapril, but both are, are useful. When we see left ventricular enlargement, and on echo, if you have it, again, uh, decreased systolic function, we add pemibenin. Pulmonary edema starts to form, gerosamide, and as I mentioned, torsamide is beginning, I wouldn't say it's replacing furosemide. Furosemide is still widely used, but it is an option if they're not responding well to furosemide. When we see the furosemide activity decrease, we add spironolactone to it. Now again, atrial fib can occur any time in this, and when it does, we add DIG, and if DIG is not enough, we'll add diltiazem to it, to slow the heart rate to get it in that target range. VPCs, ventricular premature contractions, also known as PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, we treat as needed. Now, outpatient, our primary drugs are going to be either procainamide or sotalol. And uh, no clear consensus, low-dose beta blockers will be used by some clinicians. Uh, more commonly, I see it not being used, but either would be acceptable. I think I went over the rationale for that. All right, so that was your standard slowly progressing small dog mitral valve disease. Dilated cardiomyopathies are more likely to present to you in emergencies in acute or per-acute decompensation. The other one, the mitral valve disease, you can see in acute presentation, particularly when they rupture a chordae tendinae. So you can go from a, a relatively compensated mitral valve disease to an acute decompensated case if they rupture a chordae tendinae. That chordae tendinae is again the little string keeping the mitral valve from uh, going too far and once it ruptures it just flops back and forth and has no no control at, ever, at all. So obviously they're hypoxic so first thing is get them on oxygen. Uh, they're gonna have pulmonary edema so get them on furosemide you can use intermittent. CRIs seem to be a little better, uh, um, so more commonly we'll use CRIs of furosemide. Now you may send them home on oral if you get them compensated, but generally this is parenteral here. Not universally, but I like opioids in this as well. And opioids, again, in humans, morphine is what they use. Morphine vasodilates the splanchnic vessels, which decrease preload. I don't use it as much in veterinary medicine because of the emetogenic effects of, of morphine. So I'll use something else. And, and we don't know that the other drugs, the other opioids, probably don't have this on preload, but they do desensitize the CO2 receptor. Now that's not directly helping the heart failure, but what it is doing is it's relieving the dyspnea that the animal is suffering from. They're extremely hypercapnic, and that hypercapnic, that high CO2, is making them pant, and they're starving for air. They're gasping for air. And you can blunt that with an opioid and calm them down, not just from the sedative effect of the opioid, but they just don't feel like they're starving for air like they want for, okay, and well tolerated. If they've got pleural effusions of any significance, you need to drain that, all right? So thoracocentesis. Abdominal paracentesis for ascites depends on the severity. We would rather draw mild to moderate ascites off with diuretics. But if it's severe enough, 
that they're so swollen they can't get a good diaphragmatic excursion, then we will tap the belly and drain off at least part of the ascites. Uh, now, I like dobutamine, but I, uh, if you don't have it, and even if you do, I wouldn't complain if you put pimabin in here. So either dobutamine or pimabinin. Again, Dr. Moran likes both, particularly if the blood pressure is low. Uh, he likes the dobutamine combined with it. Uh, he thinks he gets better control of the hypotension in a heart failure with the combination. We'll add nitroglycerin to the inside of the ear in these early situations to decrease after preload through its venodilation. And if they're bad enough, we'll control the arrhythmias. Now, the worst ones, you'll also have to add an afterload. Kind of what I just did is your, is your severe, but you're making progress. They seem to be responding. If they're not responding, then we, we'll go to afterload reduction. And you've got choices. I mentioned amlodipine is probably what you're going to have mostly in your clinic. If you uh, become a cardiologist or you work in a intensive care emergency situation and can monitor blood pressure, then nitroprusside is a great drug because, again, vasodilates preload pre, um, pre and afterload. And here are some targets for you. And lastly, these are really bad. And you can have so much pulmonary edema, you'll actually have foam coming out the animal's mouth and nose, bubbles um, from the panting and the fluid in the lung. One of the little tricks that uh, I was taught, uh, you're giving them oxygen, I said already, bubble the oxygen through ethanol. 20% ethanol. So get it down to your liquor store and get some grain alcohol and cut it and bubble your oxygen through that and that ethanol will act as a surfactant. If you've ever, if you ever, I do this actually, uh, has nothing to do with cardiology, but, but when I, I clean a, um, a bottle with soap and water, one of my pet peeves is getting rid of the soap bubbles. It seems like you never can get it rinsed. Pour a little isopropyl alcohol, shake it around, and it does away with all the foam. Uh, <coughs> so <laughs> you learn something else besides pharmacology. <laughs> all right. uh, and we'll put them on a ventilator. Ventilators are routinely used in human medicine for uh, these severe cases. They use PEEP, which stands for positive end expiratory pressure. And in an uh, animal on room air, breathing on its own, remember uh, at the end of exhalation, right before the next breath, they're at atmospheric pressure. They develop a negative pressure to pull air into the lung, and then they exhale and it comes back to atmospheric pressure. What you do with PEEP is you put a valve on exhalation that doesn't allow it to come back to room atmospheric pressure. It keeps it uh, five to 10 centimeters above room pressure. And that extra little added pressure helps push the edema out of the alveolus and back into the lymphatics and um, capillaries. Uh, and it's, it's very effective, but A, it has to be, you have to have a ventilator, all right, which is extremely intense. Again, unless you're in an intensive care situation, you probably won't have one. Now you can do it with an anesthetic machine. The other reason we don't do this is that there's no point in doing it if they don't have a reversible condition uh, or at least one that you can get them into a compensated condition. If the prognosis is so bad that they need P, probably their overall prognosis is not very good anyway. So you may not use it, but you will see it used and uh, in certain instances where uh, you have some expectation they can make a recovery. 